Awesome. Well, thanks, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome. My name is Mark Mello. I'm a park ranger at Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park. And I'm very excited to be here with you all today. Uh, thank you to the Winsocket Public Library for inviting me. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about the Blackstone Canal um, and a little bit about the history and how it connects to Winsocket. Um, and so I'll do my best. We'll keep this to right around uh, 30, 35 minutes, hopefully. Um, and then we'll have time for question and answer uh, at the end of that. I, I've noticed, that at least from my perspective, watching a lot of Zooms, um, that I have an attention span of about 30 to 45 minutes of actually listening to somebody talk in front of a computer screen. Um, so I will do my best to, to limit myself uh, to that 30 to 45 minutes as well. Um, because I find beyond that, uh, I myself fall asleep. So I, I hope I do not lull anybody to sleep during this presentation um, because it is a very interesting topic. And thanks again to the Winsocket Public Library for inviting me. So I'm going to share my screen here and uh, we'll get started. The Blackstone Canal Engineering a Vision. Um, and I always like to talk, uh, start talking about the Blackstone Canal with a, a question. Um, and my question is, how many of you still use a flip phone? Or, or how many of you still have an iPhone 3? Or, or how many people here listening have a PlayStation 1 or dial-up internet? Uh, usually, although with the flip phone, I, I have to admit my father still uses a flip phone. So there are some people who still use a flip phone. But by and large, most of that technology, although it was still very much in vogue just 10, 15 years ago, has gone out of style. Because technology and, and our advances in technology have surpassed uh, where we were just 10 to 15 years ago. It, it always amazes me how far we have come in such a short time when it comes to technology. And in a similar way, albeit not quite as rapid, but we see this same kind of rapid change over a very uh, small bit of time um, throughout the American Industrial Revolution, throughout the 1800s into the 1900s. And, and, and it's rapid to the point where when we look at transportation, what we're going to do today and talk a little bit about this transportation revolution that happens, when we start this talk in the 1790s, people are still traveling the same way that Julius Caesar and the ancient Romans had traveled nearly uh, 1800 years before. And even beyond that, since the invention of the wheel and affixing that wheel to the cart, people for millennia, for thousands of years, transported goods the same way. And yet what we're going to see today is this rapid change in transportation, specifically starting in the early 19th century with the eventual uh, invention of the steam engine. And in just a mere hundred years, we go from transporting goods the same way that Julius Caesar had done 1800 years before to literally by the 1960s going to the moon. Hundred years, we go from primitive uh, ways of transporting goods to automobiles, planes, and eventually space rockets. That is amazing. And it's a rapid change over time. And it is in, in very many ways uh, emblematic of the Industrial Revolution as a whole. Um, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's start off as we always typically do here in the Blackstone River Valley with the unassuming yellow mill that still sits along the banks of the Blackstone River, Slater Mill. Um, you can see here on the left of the slide a, a sketch of what Slater Mill would have looked like when it was originally built in 1793. Uh, very unassuming, uh, not at all, doesn't even have the bell tower on it yet. Um, about half the size of the building that we see there today, actually a little bit smaller than half the size of the building that still stands today. Um, it basically just a large shed or barn. Um, to eventually it growing to four times that original size. Um, and today, looking something like this 1930s picture here on, on the right, um, with the bell tower still on it, which is roughly what the building would have looked like in 1830. Now, this unassuming yellow mill is the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution. The first mill in the United States of America to uh, spin cotton into thread. And the changes of the Industrial Revolution, although we consider Slater Mill the birthplace, do not happen overnight. 
It's not as if um, in December of 1793, Slater Mill is built and all of a sudden the next day, the world has changed. It's a, a relatively slow progression over the, fall, uh, over the decades that follow through the early 1800s into the mid and late 1800s that this idea of a revolution, a change in the way that we produce things really starts to take hold. But it, it does start here along the banks of the Blackstone River. I always like to tell people that it, it, by just 15 years after Slater Mill is built, there's still only a handful about a dozen, a little over a dozen uh, textile mills in the entire Northeast, uh, not just here in the Blackstone River Valley. But by just a mere 15 years later, by the 18, mid 1820s into the 1830s, we have 119 cotton spinning mills in, the, in Rhode Island alone. That's the revolution, right? That's the rapid change. And it comes slightly after Slater Mill. But it's undeniable that what is started at Slater Mill is a change in the way of life. And it precipitates other changes that are going to occur, continue to occur throughout this time that we know as the Industrial Revolution. Now, the Blackstone River Valley pre-industrializing um, looks something like this, right? And, and you can visit uh, Riverbend Farm in Uxbridge. This is taken from uh, King Phillips Rock. Um, there within that state park up in Massachusetts. And, and it's a beautiful vista, right? This valley, this wide open valley with this wide floodplain and this meandering river. And at this point in the river, it seems as though you could transport goods along the river, right? Uh, we can't see any noticeable uh, fall, waterfalls or rocks blocking the way, right? You would think that you'd be able to transport a, a boat up and down that river fairly easily. But in other parts of the Blackstone River, like here in the Blackstone Gorge, I'm um, in Blackstone, Massachusetts, I'm um, in into Rhode Island, uh, we see a very different picture. A lot of waterfalls, rocks, uh, rivers are oftentimes difficult to manage. And I love this quote by Ben Franklin, uh, rivers are ungovernable things, especially in hilly country, which the Blackstone Valley is. Um, canals are, are quiet and very manageable. And so the building of a canal, this human made waterway is much more manageable and much more easy to uh, transport goods across. Whereas rivers, especially a river like the Blackstone that drops 440 feet over 46 miles, that's a, about nine and a half feet that the river drops for every mile it travels. That's not a navigable river. It just isn't. In parts it is, uh, but by and large, it's not navigable for its entire length. So the idea of building a canal starts as early as the 1790s, actually. Um, and, and people down here in Providence, where my little laser pointer is, I hope you can see the little laser pointer on the screen, people down in Providence, um, want to build a canal that's going to connect them to the interior of Massachusetts, specifically with a very small village known as Worcester. Um, and what most people would consider central Massachusetts, although geographically speaking, it's a little bit further east than center. Most people say that Worcester is central Massachusetts. Um, and so they want to connect this largely farming area at the time, um, connect it directly to the Port of Providence. And as early as 1790, uh, some of the earliest industrialists in the valley, people like the Brown family, Moses Brown specifically, are arguing that we need a canal to make transportation of goods between Worcester and Providence easier. At that time period, to give you a little bit of an idea of how much it cost to transport goods by road at the time, it cost the same thing. So imagine you have a, a certain amount of goods, right, that you wanted to transport. For our uh, cases, I'm looking at a computer. So let's say you had 10 computers that you wanted to transport from Worcester, Massachusetts to Providence, Rhode Island in the 1790s. Obviously we wouldn't be transporting computers, but you get my point. If we were transporting that amount of goods from Worcester to Providence in the 1790s, it would cost the exact same amount of money to transport those 10 computers from Boston, Massachusetts across the Atlantic Ocean to London, England. It costs the same to transport that same amount of product from Boston to London as it does over land, only 46 miles. Mind you, the Atlantic crossing is hundreds of hundreds of miles. 
um, it would cost the same to transport that amount of material by boat across the ocean, by ship across the ocean, as it would to transport that material over land from Worcester to Providence. There's got to be a cheaper way. There's got to be a better way. And people like Moses Brown are arguing that the better way is kind of this new era that we see starting in the late 1700s here in the United States of America, this era of building canals. The problem for those down in Providence, though, is that our friends up in Boston, Massachusetts, don't like the idea. The folks up in Boston fear that if this canal is built connecting Worcester to Providence, that it's going to draw all of that wealth and all of those uh, materials that are being produced out here in central Massachusetts away from Boston and down the Providence. And one of my favorite quotes out of the time is from a newspaper in Boston, which says, if this canal is allowed to be brought in, uh, Boston will become nothing more than a fishing port. Now, to you and me today, that might seem ridiculous that they would think that that would ever be the case. But back in the 1790s, that was a real fear for people who lived in Boston. They wanted to remain the economic power in the area. And so the Boston officials say, no, we're not allowing you to build a canal connecting Worcester to Providence. Now, as time progresses, however, people start to look to other places, and this is a lovely um, uh, painting of Providence um, right around the time period that we're talking about in the early 1800s. Um, people start to look to other areas where they're building these water canals, these transportation canals, and they're like, wow, it's working and it's working well. They look at places like the Erie Canal, the Middlesex Canal, and, and they're seeing the great success um, that's being reaped from building canals and the ease of transportation. And so by the 1820s, people even in Boston are starting to reconsider um, and they're gonna start to look into the idea of building this canal that would connect Worcester to Providence. And they're gonna call in a man by the name of Benjamin Wright, who, is the chief en who was the chief engineer building the Erie Canal. So this is somebody who knows what he's doing. Uh, he has a lot of experience and he's gonna do the survey and he's going to uh, basically come back and say that it's feasible, it's doable, we can build this canal. A and then people like prominent uh, merchants and industrialists in Providence, especially Nicholas Brown um, and his nephew, John Brown, his brother-in-law, Thomas Point and Ives, a gentleman by the name of Edward Carrington, they're gonna really start to push for this canal. Uh, and they're gonna be successful. Um, and they're gonna form a company, the Blackstone Canal Company. Uh, and they're gonna ask for a stock to be sold to people. And at first they wanna sell 5,000 shares um, totaling $500,000 because that's believed to be the approximate cost of what it's going to take to build this Blackstone Canal, about $500,000. So they want to sell 5,000 shares of it, and they do. And they actually sell more shares than they were anticipating, um, and they didn't want the extra money, so they return it. The biggest mistake of those who are operating the Blackstone Canal Company in that like every public works project in the history of public works projects, the canal goes over budget and they're going to want that money back and they're going to have difficulty um, overcoming the deficit that the canal begins. The canal, when it's finished, actually is already at a loss uh, because they have not brought in enough stock to pay for how much it costs to build the canal. Now, uh, this is an example of one of those stocks that are being sold by the Blackstone Canal Company, um, give you an idea uh, of uh, what they would have looked like, this individual purchasing um, this part in, this share in uh, the Blackstone Canal. Now, one of the major problems that uh, the company faces, um, and one of the major reasons why this ends up in the long run going over budget, is that the Blackstone Valley, although it's doable to build a canal in it. It is fairly difficult terrain to build a canal. Just in and of itself, the fact that the river drops nine and a half miles for every, uh, nine and a half feet for every mile that the river goes, that's a major drop. Um, and a canal boat, uh, you, you can't build a canal uh, going downhill like this. You have to build locks in order to overcome that drop in the river as you're going along from Worcester to Providence. And we're going to talk a little bit about what a lock was and how it worked in a little bit. Uh, but locks were expensive to construct, as was the whole project. Uh, and it very quickly, it goes over budget. Um, but 
uh, they are going to build this canal route um, from Worcester, from the highlands up in Worcester, all the way down following the Blackstone River. And what they're going to decide to do to save some money is in places where there's slack water. So for example, behind a dam um, in a mill pond, they're going to utilize that water that's not moving fast, that's relatively flat as part of the canal. So they're literally going to weave the Blackstone Canal in and out of the river. So in the portions where they're actually in the river itself, in these ponds, in these mill ponds behind the dams, they don't need to dig a trench. But in other places, for example, like this picture here on the left, um, which is taken at Blackstone River State Park in Lincoln, Rhode Island, very close to the Kelly House Transportation Museum, uh, they're actually going to have to physically dig a human-made waterway. And you can obviously tell, right, this is not natural. Um, most people just looking at it in and of itself, it's too perfect, right, to be uh, of nature. A natural river meanders, it flows, it goes where it will. This is very much a constructed, a human-constructed waterway. Um, and there's a few parts of this canal that they're going to have to construct. And the three basic parts of this construction, what they're building here, um, is the trench and the towpath, locks, and dams and reservoirs. So let's take a look at uh, each one of those in turn. So first we'll start with the trench and the towpath. Uh, this image up here on the top right of your screen um, is a cross section of, uh, is a cross section of uh, what the canal would have looked like. Um, so you can see here, it, it's what's known as, get ready for this, this is a big word, uh, a prismatic cross section, which basically means that it, it tapers down. So it starts wide on top and it gets skinnier on the bottom. And you can see that here it, it, on roughly about a half slope curve. So if we go back to algebra class, a uh, one half slope um, coming down, um, from the top um, to its bottom. On average, uh, the canal is about 32 feet across the top and about 18 feet on the bottom. And there's about four to six feet of water that sits in the canal. So four to six feet of water, roughly 32 feet at its widest point on top and about 18 feet on the bottom. Now that does change uh, in different sections. We see sections of the canal that are as skinny as 30 feet on top and some sections of the canal that are as wide as 45 feet on top. But on average, it's somewhere between 32 on top and 18 on the bottom. Alongside of the canal itself is this very important uh, piece of the canal construction, what's called the towpath. And the towpath is how we're going to move canal boats, canal barges, up and down this canal. And they're going to be pulled by two horse teams. So if you look here on the bottom right of your screen, uh, this painting of uh, Providence at the time, uh, just north of Providence at the time, you can see the canal barge there. Um, and then right here along this, the towpath, a two horse team pulling the canal barge. Um, along its way. So it's two horse teams, uh, two horses on each team that pulls a single canal barge. Um, a lot of people think it was mules or oxen. Different uh, other canals did use oxen, uh, did use mules, um, did use donkeys. Here specifically though, uh, the Blackstone Canal Company uh, almost uh, completely uses horses um, to pull these canal uh, barges. This towpath is about 10 feet wide um, and it's flat and it's well paved. And by well paved, obviously uh, we don't have uh, cement or anything like that in the uh, 19th century in the 1820s uh, when this is being constructed, but it's gravel. So it has good drainage, it's flat, it's easy for the horses to walk across. Um, in certain sections, we see where they planted trees um, and these trees are intended to both prevent uh, erosion when it rains, um, and also to provide shade for the horses um, and, and the teamsters that are working the horses as they go. To build this canal, this trench in the towpath, um, oftentimes it, it, if we see in certain sections where there was actually like a slope 
Um, and they actually literally dug into the side of the hill and piled up all the ground, all that dirt that they were pulling up onto one side to create the towpath. And most of this work is being done by hand. Pickaxes, shovels, iron bars, wheelbarrows. Um, it, it's known as grubbing, mucking, and in some cases, a, a very few, we have very few examples where this did happen, where they were actually going through rock ledges, where they actually used black powder to blast through um, the rock. But by and large, this is dug by hand. Um, and primarily, uh, this is, is done uh, by Irish canal workers, Irish immigrants, kind of this first wave of immigration to the valley. Um, post uh, your original English settlers who come to the region in the 1600s. Um, the Irish proved to be really the first immigrant group to the valley. Uh, and many of these Irish canal diggers, some of them are coming directly from Ireland, um, but others are coming from other canal projects. They've worked on um, other canals in New York um, and other parts of Massachusetts. And now they're coming here to the Blackstone Valley to help construct um, this canal. And their work in many places still lasts today. Some of their stonework, um, amazingly, even though it has uh, gone through water, um, erosion, all of this, uh, it still stands the test of time. And we can really see that um, best in the walks um, that uh, are along the river. And that's where we'll turn our attention to next. But these laborers on the canal received roughly about $12 a month, which for the 1820s, that was pretty decent pay. Um, on average, they're getting seven and a half cents to 18 cents per yard of dirt that they excavate and about 25 cents per yard of embankment that they're able to create. So they're getting paid largely by the work that they're doing um, and for the work that they are doing. Now, uh, these uh, locks are, are a very important part of overcoming that 440 foot drop over the 46 miles. This is how we're gonna create in effect an escalator or uh, an elevator that is going to help canal barges moving from Worcester down the Providence drop in elevation and those coming from Providence up to Worcester rise in elevation. There were, were 48 lift locks um, that were constructed along the canal. 20 of those were in Rhode Island, 29 of them in Massachusetts. Um, and you'll notice, wait, Mark, you just said there were 48 lift locks. And if you do math, and you're good at math, you'll notice that I said 20 in Rhode Island and 29 in Massachusetts. Mark, that's 49. I know. Um, and the reason for that is that the last lock along uh, the Blackstone Canal was what was called a tidal walk. And a tidal walk did not work like a lift lock. So there were 48 of these type of locks, lift locks, that actually lifted um, the barges. The last lock down in Providence, the tidal lock, lock helped to uh, maintain the flow of water and to prevent from flooding and other um, things like that. On average, these locks are going to raise or lower a canal barge 10 feet a pop. So for every lock you go through, on average, you're going up roughly 10 feet, um, anywhere from nine and a half to 10 feet um, that they're going to raise you. These are only 10 feet wide, um, so very narrow. And for most of these canal barges, and we'll talk a little bit about their construction in a few minutes, uh, but for most of these canal barges, it's a very tight fit. Um, but about 10 feet wide and usually about 82 feet in length. So 10 feet here and roughly 82 feet between the two gates. Now, if you're not familiar with how a lock works, um, I do have this video here. Hopefully. Okay. In their voyage between Providence and Worcester, canal boats had to travel 44 miles in a horizontal direction, as well as 438 feet in a vertical direction to overcome the difference between sea level in Providence and the Worcester Highlands. The boats made this vertical journey one step at a time by passing through each of the canal's 48 locks. The canal lock was a long, narrow stone chamber, 82 feet long, 10 feet wide, and 13 feet deep on average, with a pair of large wooden gates at either end. The gates were opened and shut by pushing on their wooden balance beams. At the bottom of each gate was a small sluice, also known as a wicket or paddle gate, 
which could be opened by a long iron rod that ran to the top of the gate. The canal company employed lock keepers to operate the locks and provided some of them with houses by the canal. The lock keeper might also collect tolls from the passing boatmen. When a canal boat approached a lock, its captain blew a horn to alert the lock keeper of their arrival. For a boat traveling upstream, the upper gates would be closed and the lower gates opened. The boat would enter the lock and the lower gates would be closed behind it. The lock keeper would then open the sluices in the upper gates, allowing in a stream of water that would fill the lock. Once the water level in the lock matched the level in the upper section of the canal, the lock keeper would open the upper gates and the boat would continue its journey upstream. The process could then be reversed for a boat traveling downstream. The boat would enter the filled lock from the upper level, the lock keeper would close the upper gates behind it and open the lower sluices. As the water ran out, the boat would descend to the lower level. The locks would raise or lower a boat about nine and a half feet on average. The so you get the point of how that works. Um, and these locks are not just an important part of um, raising and lowering these boats, but they're also an awesome example of construction and, and the work that went into these. So this, for example, is the Millville in Millville, Massachusetts. Um, which still stands one of the best examples of a lock still um, standing here in the Blackstone River Valley. Uh, and you can see the intricate stonework carving that granite uh, so precisely placed um, and so precisely cut. Uh, they're not using any kind of mortar or fixative. This is pure uh, artisanship. Um, and it's really a testament to those stone cutters um, and those canal workers who built these locks. Um, I, I love this picture here on the left. Um, you can see uh, one of my former colleagues, Chuck Arning, who's now retired, um, standing next to these large granite slabs here that have been cut. And you'll see how cleanly they're cut, right? Um, and, and this is done through a process with these spike-like things um, that have like a star on the end of them and pounding those into the rock and eventually using that and the leverage to split these cleanly. Uh, and, and what we see as a result is this beautiful stonework here in the bottom right in Millville. Um, and on the top right over here, uh, that is the Goat Hill Lock, which is up at River Bend Farm um, in, in Uxbridge, Massachusetts. And then the last part of the construction is what it was known as the reservoirs or dams. This is how we're getting the water into the canal to feed on the canal. And there were nine reservoirs that were constructed, which covered about 5,100 acres of land. Um, and they were utilized, hopefully, to keep the canal levels high enough during the dry spells of the summer. Um, it, it, but unfortunately for the canal workers and, and the canal investors, they were in such a rush to build this canal um, that they never put in any gauges um, in, in certain spots of, of the canal. So they never really took the time to establish what the baseline would be um, of river flow in order to adjust for it during dry seasons. And so it was really a great mistake that they did it, but they were in such a rush that they never uh, really gauged the water level, a uh, baseline for the water level. Uh, we see here some images um, on the left-hand side of up in Worcester, uh, the canal basin up in Worcester, um, and here a map of the beginnings of the canal in what was at the time a much smaller settlement um, up in Worcester, Massachusetts. They're going to hire uh, contractors as well um, that are going to help to uh, build this canal and they're going to begin the process in July of 1825 and by the spring of 1828 the canal has been completed and it is open and it goes into um, it goes into operation. And it costs roughly $700,000 to construct in 1820s money, which was about $200,000 over budget. Uh, I do want to show you uh, some maps from your area a little bit closer to Winsocket. So this is in the area of Blackstone today. Uh, Blackstone, Massachusetts, you can see here the yellow green line is the state line. Um, at that point, Smithfield, Rhode Island um, here. 
um, uh, on the left and on the opposite side of the river, what you really can't see is Cumberland, Rhode Island. Uh, both the town of Smithfield and the town of Cumberland were much larger at the time of the canal's construction. But we can see here what I was talking about earlier with the canal moving in and out of the river, right? So here where my laser pointer is on the left side of the screen, here the canal was part of the river. And then it veered off into a dug trench comes down here and we can see right here a, a lock. So they would have lowered the canal boat down at that point and then the canal barge would have gone into the river again, followed along in the river in this slack water, in this pond water, eventually again here leaving the river to go into a dug trench. Um, so we see the canal weaving in and out of the river itself. Here we are in uh, Woonsocket, uh, granted a later map of Woonsocket than the 1820s. Um, but I, I show you this map because a lot of uh, what we see today um, in Woonsocket, it, 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 it's more of a similar landscape that you might be able to recognize than if I was to show you a map from the 1830s of Woonsocket. Um, so we see here where the Blackstone Canal would have come into the river, followed along here, this light yellow highlighting indicates uh, the route of the canal where it would have left the Blackstone River at that very precipitous bend down in the area of Market Square today. and would have continued traveling um, uh, basically in parallel to Main Street up and eventually around uh, the Court Street Bridge, the canal would have dumped back into uh, the Blackstone River at that point. And I did put this little star over here on the right side of the screen um, at the approximate location of where the library is. Uh, the library in reality probably would be a little bit further off the screen than where the star is. But roughly speaking, you're within a stone's throw of where the Blackstone Canal, if you're at the library, obviously, uh, you would have been within a stone's throw of where the canal would have cut through um, in Market Square and over and across back into the Blackstone River. I believe this signage still stands there. Um, in Market Square talking a little bit about the canal and in the parking lot there uh, off in the distance we can see the Museum of Work and Culture kind of poking out um, over here in the background of this middle picture on the right but uh, the, through the parking lot this stone area here roughly following where the canal would have been. Now one of the major problems unfortunately with talking about the canal in Woonsocket is that there's so many layers of history in Woonsocket. The, the landscape has undergone so many changes that we cannot, it's very difficult for us in 2021 to imagine what it would have looked like in 1828 when the canal had opened. Um, because largely not, and it's not just the case for us, um, for folks who lived in the 1870s in Woonsocket, they too would have had difficulty imagining what the canal would have looked like when it was in operation. Because what a lot of the mills in the area do is they don't uh, fill in the Blackstone Canal right away. They continue to use it as a water power source. They use it as a water canal. So they adapt what was originally a transportation canal to suit their needs as a water power canal. Um, and so even by the 1870s, those who were looking at what was left of the Blackstone Canal would have seen something very different than their predecessors just 30 years before. Um, and never mind what we see today, it's very difficult for us to imagine what the canal would have looked like going through Woonsocket. And basically at this point, uh, whatever is left of the power canal system is below the streets and below the parking lots there. Um, Again, some images that you might recognize of certain places uh, in that area, uh, basically uh, charting out where the canal would have gone once it left Market Square and eventually re-entering the Blackstone around the Court Street Bridge. What was being transported? Um, and this is something that I think oftentimes surprises people because we talk about the Blackstone Canal within the context of the Industrial Revolution. And usually when you say the Industrial Revolution, what comes to mind? Textiles, clothing, right? That's usually what we associate with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and thus, I think a lot of people like to equate the Blackstone Canal as the transporting raw materials like cotton and finished products like cloth and thread um, up and down the valley. And the canal did do that, but uh, it did 
uh, transport a lot of other goods. And over here on the left of your screen, um, in some of these articles that appeared in the newspapers at the time, we got a good feel for the products that were traveling up and down the canal. Corn, rye, flour, salt, molasses. Um, there's your cotton right here, 889 bales of cotton, 125, 125 bales of wool, um, coal, iron, nails. Um, something, especially along the southern end of the canal, a lot of people don't realize this, but lime was a major thing that they were transporting along the canal. And lime, of course, being utilized as part of a mortar substance to help in building uh, buildings at the time. Um, so I love some of these snippets from uh, the newspapers at the time that talk about the trade happening on the canal because they really tell us a lot about what is moving up and down the canal. And we can see here in other parts here, this is in April. Um, this is uh, the transportation for the month ending in April of 1830. What was transported at that time, we see Winsocket, how many tons are going through Winsocket there at that point. We see here May of 1830, how many tons of good are moving through Winsocket at that time as well. Um, and then here on the right side of your screen, uh, just some of the advertisements that were used. Um, this one specifically for the Port of Worcester. I love that, right? We oftentimes, when you say the Port of Worcester, people go, wait, what? Worcester is a landlocked city. How could there be a port in a landlocked city? The canal. Um, and the canal turns Worcester into a thriving port city. And really, one of the greatest benefactors from the canal will be the city of Worcester. Um, and, and then this uh, ad as well, showing a canal barge uh, and the two-horse team pulling the canal boat. Um, again, some more advertisements from the time, um, and I think uh, it helps if we talk a little bit about these canal boats um, in order to understand what goods uh, they were transporting. So on average, these are anywhere from 45 to 70 feet in length. Usually most of the canal barges were closer to that 70 feet in length. So to give you a modern comparison, uh, think roughly the size of a tractor tra trailer today, roughly an 18 wheeler. Um, it is roughly 70 feet, um, a little bit off, but to give you uh, uh, kind of a rough estimate of what we're talking about, think of a 18 wheeler tractor trailer. And they were no wider than nine foot three inches um, at their width. Um, and remember the locks were 10 inches wide. So it would have to be the width of the canal barges would have to just by necessity would have to be smaller than 10 inches. And on average, they were around nine feet, three inches wide. And similar to the canal, which tapered down, remember how we talked about the construction of the canal? Canal boats did a similar thing. They tapered down. So usually at the top of the boat, uh, it was the barge, it was around nine feet, three inches wide. And at the bottom of the boat, uh, the barge, it was around seven feet, six inches wide. So tapering down in a similar way that the canal itself did. Um, on average, these barges can move anywhere from 25 to 30 tons of goods. Um, and so that's massive. When we consider what they would have done with wagons, um, transporting much larger amounts of goods. And when you can transport a lot more goods, what does that mean? Well, what happens to the price? Well, now no longer, it doesn't cost, uh, um, it doesn't cost the same to transport goods from Worcester to Providence as it does from Boston to London. Now the price of transporting goods greatly diminishes, um, which is great for those who are utilizing the canal and who are sending their products up and down the canal. On average, the boats travel about four miles per hour. Um, and so the journey between Worcester and P Providence on a canal boat would last roughly two days if you were to make the whole length of the journey. But again, not every canal barge is going to travel all the way from Providence all the way to Worcester every time. Um, some canal barges might just go from Providence to Woonsocket and back. Um, and so it, it widely varies, but on average, going four miles per hour, um, the average journey from Worcester to Providence would be two days, um, which is roughly the same speed, a little bit faster than you could have done it in a wagon, um, depending on how fast you wanted your wagon to go and how fast you wanted to wear out your horses, of course. Um, but it's much, much cheaper 
to transport goods via canal barge than it is uh, a wagon. Working these, sorry, I got ahead of myself here. We'll go back to this image. Um, working these canal boats are three man crews, um, one captain and two assistants. The captain would be pictured, actually, he's pictured quite nicely here in this uh, bottom left example here, sitting at the tiller um, on the back, directing um, the boat, um, which way they wanted it to go. Uh, an additional uh, crew member would usually be somewhere near the front of the canal barge, looking out for any impediments um, that might be in the way as they were making their way um, up or down the canal. And then the third team member would be with the horses, um, uh, encouraging the horses to keep moving um, and, and pulling the canal barges along the way. These men were from all over, um, but many of them were permanently settled here in the Blackstone Valley. Uh, we have uh, certain canal men who come from as far away as New Hampshire and Vermont, um, but in the end, most of them uh, will settle here in the valley. And they are frequently described as, quote, industrious, steady, and careful men um, by their employers. Um, and they don't make a heck of a lot of money, um, but uh, it is a job, um, and many of them will make a living off of um, working these canal barges. There's only one uh, accounted death of a uh, person who was working on the canal, um, and that is Johnny Bolger, um, who uh, in late fall, when uh, the canal was starting to ice over, fell overboard um, and, and was not able to uh, come back up to the surface and drowned, unfortunately. But he's the only recorded death um, of any of the workers along the Blackstone Canal. But obviously the canal had problems, right? It's cheaper, um, it's an easier way to transport a lot more goods, but there's some major problems that the canal has. Environmental factors, right? Uh, in the spring, we almost always get floods. Floods can make it difficult to transport goods along the canal, can literally wash out sections of the canal that then need to be fixed later on. Um, oftentimes at the end of summer, like this last year especially, um, drought is a major issue. Um, and since uh, the reservoirs didn't often work well um, or did not work as they were intended to work, um, there are times when the canal has to shut down in late summer due to uh, low water levels. And over the winter months, uh, the canal would be certainly closed because of ice and not being able to get canal barges into the water because it's frozen solid. Uh, the canal also ran into problems with some local business owners. The canal would draw water away from the river, right? And if I'm a mill owner who has my mill that's water powered along that same section, and I look here and the canal is drawing water away from the river, right? I don't like that. And so there's a few uh, court cases that ensue between the canal company and some business owners over water rights. And who has a right to use this water? And oftentimes the case is, I was here first, the industrial mill owner is claiming, uh, and these people are taking away my water from me. Um, so there are all these, uh, there are a lot of negatives that come with the canal as well. But ultimately the death knell in this bottom right picture here alludes to it, um, will be the invention of the railroad, the steam engine. Um, in the building of railroads, at first connecting Boston and Worcester, then Providence and Boston, and ultimately by 1848, the construction of the Providence and Worcester Railroad. Uh, 1847, excuse me, the construction, uh, the opening of the Providence and Worcester Railroad. And the railroad, I love this picture, right? Because it juxtaposes, it places side by side the old and the new. Uh, the railroad here running along the old towpath, and we can see here on the right side of the picture, the canal branching off from the river. Um, and the railroad transported goods faster and cheaper. And by the 1850s, some of these steam engines are moving at speeds upwards of 40 to 50 miles per hour. Um, and so that cuts down a journey from Worcester to Providence from two days 
to literally a little over or right around an hour, which if you're keeping track at home is roughly the same speed that we can travel in an automobile between Worcester and Providence today. Um, and so this increased speed, this increased capacity, lower prices, the transport goods is ultimately going to be the death knell for the Blackstone Canal. And by 1848, just 20 years after its opening, the Blackstone Canal Company will go out of business um, and will be closed permanently, supplanted by the Providence and Worcester Railroad. Uh, in November of 1847, at a meeting of the Providence and Worcester Railroad, uh, the leaders, the investors, a toast is given. And the toast is this, quote, to the two unions between Worcester and Providence. The first was weak as water, the last as strong as iron, end quote. Obviously referring to the water, meaning the canal, and iron referring to the railroad. A much stronger bond between Worcester and Providence has been created. In the end, the success of the canal was probably summed up the best by a gentleman by the name of William Lincoln, who was a contemporary of the canal. Um, he wrote this, quote, the canal was more useful to the public than it was to the owners of the canal, end quote. Um, and for those who reap the benefits of transporting goods on the canal, um, for those 20 years of its operation certainly reaped the benefits more than those who had invested in the canal. Um, historian Rick Greenwood says this, quote, the canal brought a more localized prosperity to the towns and villages, villages it touched directly. Through the disbursement of money by the Blackstone Canal Company during construction, the influx of tradesmen taking advantage of the canal commerce and the appreciation of property values, end quote. So these villages, places like Winsocket, and certainly a place like Worcester is going to be the true beneficiaries of this, and they're going to really reap the benefits of the Blackstone Canal. And we see this in the population growth in a lot of these places as a result of the canal. So for example, in Worcester, in 1825, there was 3,650 residents there. Just 10 years later, in 1835, that population had doubled. It had literally taken almost a century for that population to double from about 1,500 to 3,600. And it took in just a mere 10 years. Uh, it doubled again. By 1835, the population of Worcester was 6,624 people. Um, so places like Worcester really truly reaping the benefits. But this technological advancement, uh, this better way of transporting goods in the 1820s, the Blackstone Canal, uh, very quickly surpassed by the railroad. And the railroad still operates today, um, uh, but obviously eventually the railroad is overcome by automobiles, planes, um, and, and it, it itself. Um, and, and so we see this progression in transportation technology throughout the latter half of the 19th century into the early half of the 20th century. And so what's the lesson from all this, right? What can we derive from the story of the Blackstone Canal? Well, I think the most potent thing about this whole story is that change is inevitable. None of us like change. I don't like change, uh, but certainly technological changes are inevitable. The important question for us is not whether change will come. Um, it is of how we as people, as humans, will deal and adjust to the change? Will we allow change to have a positive or a negative impact on the human experience in our, and on our own individual lives? And with that, um, I'm going to conclude my talking part of the presentation.